As we entered into World War I, the British already had a presence in the Middle East. Egypt was a, already a British protectorate, and it formalized this as, as we entered into World War I. And they don't get their independence until 1922, and the British just don't hand it to them. They fight for this. They have a revolt against British rule, and they win. So you have an independent Egypt in 1922. The British also had Kuwait as a protectorate, and this is from the 1800s, and they don't get their independence until 1961. Now, we also know that the British were eager to get the help of the Arabs to essentially convince the Arabs to revolt against the Ottomans so that they could fight the, successfully fight the Ottomans on the Sinai and Pal Palestine fronts and on the Mesopotamia front. And in particular, they tried to convince this gentleman, Hussein bin Ali, who at the time, at the beginning of World War I, is the Sharif of Mecca. And in order to convince him, they make promises to them. We, we, you, we have a whole video on the McMahon-Hussein correspondence where they say, look, if you help us, we will give you an independent state, an independent Arab state that would include all of this territory except for maybe, except for maybe this region right up here. And so, with those British assurances, he agrees to commit his forces to fight in the Arab revolt, to rise up, and to help the British. And from that point on, in 1916, where you have the Arab revolt, he declares himself as the king of the Hejaz. And just as a little bit of a geography tangent right over here, this is the Hejaz. It's kind of the west coast of the Arabian Peninsula, and it contains the very influential towns of Mecca and Medina. Now, you might say, well, whatever happened to the Hejaz? Isn't, most, isn't all of this region right now Saudi Arabia? And you are correct. And what happened shortly after, so in 1916, he declares himself king of the Hejaz. But then you had another group, the Saudis, in the Nejd region, which is this area right over here. So they... They are, ably, they are able to, in, 1920, in 1925, successfully, successfully, successfully conquer the Nejd. And you have Ibn Saud, who declares himself king of the Nejd and Hijaz from 1926 to 1932. And he later merges them into Saudi Arabia. And he's the first king of Saudi Arabia all the way until 1953. So that's how you get Saudi Arabia. Now let's continue. Let's rewind back to World War I. You have the Arab Revolt. He Hussein bin Ali declares himself the king of the Hejaz. Two of his sons are very active in collaborating with the British to fight against the Ottomans. This right over here is Fasil bin Hussein. Bin Hussein literally means son of Hussein. This right over here is Abdullah. And by the end of the war, and we covered this in the Sinai, Palestine, and Mesopotamia campaigns, the combined British and, and, and Arab forces are able to move all the, way into, all the way into what is now northern Syria. They're all also able to move into what is now northern, what is now northern Iraq. And you can imagine at this point, the Arabs are eager in a post post-world environment to have their state. And the reason why they're a little bit uncertain about their future is based on what some of the things that came out during the war. We now know that while the British were, were trying to convince Hussein bin Ali to, to get his forces to rise up against the Ottomans, they were, they were dealing with the French in the secret Sykes-Picot agreement to essentially carve up this whole territory between the British and the French. They really weren't talking about independent states for the Arabs. A few years later, in 1917, this was still during the war, while the war was happening, you have the Balfour Declaration, which declared the, the British intent to create a homeland for the Jewish people. And then a month later, or really at the end of that month, November 1917, the Russians make the Sykes-Picot Agreement public. So all of these things made, made the Arabs very uneasy. They got assurances from the British that, oh, you know, that wasn't that serious of an agreement. Uh, you know, just keep, keep fighting with us. So at the end of the war, they were eager to, to, get, to get what they thought was their, their just claim. And so you have Faisal bin Hussein. He attends the Paris Peace Conference in 1919. So 1919, you have the Paris... Paris Peace Conference. And just to be clear, at that point in time, it wasn't obvious that you necessarily had to have this, what we now have is this conflict between what is now Israel and the Arab people. Fasil bin Hussein was actually 
eager to, to kind of reach out to the world Zionist organization, to the Zionist movement, to hopefully get their help in establishing an independent Arab state. He didn't think that they would, that they would establish an independent Jewish state, but he, he said, hey, look, if, if, I can, if, I can, if they can have a homeland here, but in, but in order to get that homeland, they're willing to support me for an independent Arab state, then I might kind of send out an olive branch to them. And this right over here is a quote by Fassel bin Hussein. And this is while he's trying to get support for an independent Arab state, one that uh, he would argue was promised to him by, by the McMahon, uh, the McMahon uh, correspondences with his father. So this is Fassel. We Arabs look with the deepest sympathy on the Zionist movement. Our deputation here in Paris is fully acquainted with the proposals submitted yesterday by the Zionist organization to the peace conference. And we regard them as moderate and proper. We will do our best, insofar as we are concerned, to help them through. We will wish the Jews a most hearty welcome home. I look forward, and my people with me look forward, to a future in which we will help you and you will help us, so that the countries in which we are mutually interested may once again take their places in the community of the civilized peoples of the world. But he did throw on this caveat. He was doing this because he wanted their support for an independent state, and he did throw on the caveat, look, this, this only applies, I'm only supportive, essentially, of the Balfour Declaration if we get our independent state. So he really wanted, he really wanted an independent, independent state. And he explicitly said, hey, look, if we don't get an independent state, all the stuff I said here doesn't, doesn't really apply. And so you end up with the Treaty of Sev in 1920. And it turns out that, that the Sykes-Picot Agreement held a lot more weight than the assurances between McMahon and Hussein, because in the Treaty of Sev, this area was divided essentially according to the Sykes-Picot Agreement. Up here, this whole region was given to France. They called it a mandate, which is essentially it was allowed to be occupied by France, but they called it a mandate to the, the allies wanted it to be called a mandate. So it didn't look like France was getting something. A mandate is kind of, hey, you have to come help these people to transition them to establish a state, to help them transition institutions so eventually they can get independence. The the allies wanted it to appear that look, you're look, look, central powers, look, Ottomans, you're not giving us something. You're not giving us this territory. You're giving us you're giving us a responsibility. But needless to say, they were eager to occupy this territory. So eager that when Fassel bin Hussein in 1920 declared himself king of Syria, they booted him out and he was in really no power to, to kind of contest that booting out. This area right over here, and this was pretty much in line with the Sykes-Picot Agreement, became a British. This whole area right over here became a British mandate. Now, in, in what is now Iraq, you essentially have an uprising in 1920. They don't, they don't appreciate. They, they thought that they were going to become independent now. They were free of the Ottomans. But now, all of a sudden, the British come, and, come and, and, and say that they're in charge. So you have this revolt against the British in 1920. The British start to realize, gee, this is kind of expensive trying to, trying to, to keep control of this. Maybe we should, we should install someone, when, and we'll still kind of keep this as a protectorate, as a mandated territory. But we, we should, why don't we install someone who, who uh, uh, an Arab leader as the king of this region. And so they install Fassel bin Hussein as a king of Iraq. And he is a king of Iraq, essentially under protection or under influence of the British from 1921 until 1933. And that's when they finally get independence of, of the British in 1932. Now, when they get booted out of Syria, his brother Abdullah, son of Hussein bin Ali, he's allowed to become king of Transjordan. And they later get independence in 1946 after World War II, at which point he becomes the king of Jordan. Syria and Lebanon, they don't get independence until during or after World War II. Lebanon gets independence in 1943. Syria gets independence from the French in 1946. And we know that the mandate of Palestine, which the British kept, this would continue to be a sore point through World War II, and then with the establishment of the State of Israel shortly afterwards, it becomes a, 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 a very, I guess we could say, hot point in international affairs.